for 30 plus years. I've seen every type of child grow up. It's always a delight to just talk about how we leave a legacy for generations to come. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. It's been able to change into a time of my life that I am grateful for. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode two, Parenting Your Child's Inner World. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. Parents, this podcast exists for you. I want you to catch your breath. You know what? Close your eyes, as long as you're not driving, of course. Take a breath. And I want you to know this today. You are the most distinct possible parent your child could ever have. The fact that you are your child's parent is not an accident. I don't believe in accidents. I believe in providence. I don't believe in accidents. No other human being alive has your specific DNA, your ability to love your child like you do. No one. You are completely distinct and necessary. I want you to take that in, parents. I want you to just think about that. And I want to say something else that I don't think you're hearing enough, and that's this. Thank you for giving your vulnerability, your sincerity, your laughter and tears, your attention, your time, your sweat, your agony, even when you wanted to run away from that situation or from that child or from that fight or from that slam door or that screaming, thank you for staying because kids grow and they change. Get that. Your legacy as a parent is all of those mundane moments where you thought life was boring and you're not getting through to that child. That's what makes your child a great adult. That's what makes him strong. Not the special moments, not the times when you spent a lot of money to do something. The mundane moments where you lived life next to your child, they actually matter. So in this episode, I'm going to share with you something I am very passionate about. Your child has two worlds. This is very important for you to understand. You intuitively understand, but your child has two worlds. Each child has an external and an internal world. I'm going to talk to you about how to connect more with your child's inner world where his feelings, his character, his being, his spirit life lives. And the inner world is not about what he does or performs. It's about who he is. I'm going to help you avoid the mania of performance, of doing, of going and going and going. It's exhausting, isn't it? But fear not. You can drop crazy and pick up healthy right away. I also had a chance to sit down with my good friend, radio talk show host, author and speaker, Dave Ramsey. Dave's a father of three adult children, and I had a blast talking with him about the inner world of our children. As usual, in this episode, I'm going to give you some points to ponder that you can act upon right away. And just a reminder, don't just listen or download. Click the subscribe button next to the title of this podcast. Tell your family and friends the same. I appreciate it. But it also helps you because when you subscribe, new episodes update automatically for you. Before I give you this episode's points to ponder, listen in on a conversation with my good friend and first official podcast guest, Dave Ramsey. Ramsey, I am so excited to have you as my very first guest. You're so gracious to come and let me interview you and let our listeners have a peek into Dave Ramsey, the man, dad, grandpa, because I know a little bit about your personal life and I just admire your character. So thanks so much for joining me on my podcast. Well, we love Dr. Meg Meeker and to be part of this <laughs> launch is a big deal. It is a big deal. This is really, really important thanks. work you're doing and well, we're honored to be with you. So Dave Ramsey exposed. Here we go. Right, oh, <laughs> Dave no. Ramsey exposed. no here right is here. It's happening. The real deal. The real deal. You and I have talked about, and I know I gave a lecture at this on Smart Conference, about the fact that kids have an 
inner self and an outer self. There's an inner child and an outer child. And parenting that and how our culture, we, we train people to parent the external world of our kids. You know, make sure they get enough stuff. Make sure they go to the right schools. Make sure they grow up and have a job that's going to make them a lot of money. Make sure they look really good. But really, to build great character in kids, you have to attend to the inner core of your child. You have to worry about their faith and their feelings and their character. And I know that's important to you. What are some of the important ways you taught great character to your three kids? You know, I don't know that it was ever like Tuesday night is character building night. I mean, we didn't, you know, it was not like some kind of weird thing like that. Stuff like we believe in hard work, believe in telling the truth. And you believe if you're going to do something, you know, it's the sayings good grandmas used to have, you know, and <laughs> yeah. good, and those things are just woven into the fabric of our lives. It, 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 and I think that's how we did it. And, you know, anything worth doing is worth doing right. You know, right. so go clean yeah. it up again. You, that's not clean. So sometimes there's a, a hard knock that the parent gives the child to build that character. And then, and then the juxtaposition of that is there's a time when they're a child and yes. you have to be there with grace yes. and with mercy. And, you, you know, you, you lift them back up after they've gotten knocked down. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I don't know that there was a certain thing, but it's just the basics of hard work and integrity and, you know, loving God and, and respect. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. And no, ma'am. I'm from the South. Yeah. You know, my mama said stuff like, uh, you know, you got to say the magic word, please. And thank you. Mm-hmm. Those are magic words. Right. I don't I don't hear people say that kind of stuff anymore. I It's, it's true. Yeah. And, yeah. And that, that kind of respect, those kinds of respect, integrity, work ethic, uh, you know, excellence mm-hmm. and uh, uh, dignity. But whatever they were doing, whether it's, uh, you know, Daniel playing ice hockey, uh, Rachel playing soccer, Rachel and Denise playing softball. You know, you're going to be in there and you're going to be your head's going to be in the game and you're going to do all you can do and you're going to do the practices Mm -hmm. and you're not going to be a prima donna. And so they were kind of journeymen, if you will, in sports. Right. But but they had a blast. We had fun with it. And we're going to have fun. So you didn't as your kids were growing up, you didn't push them and expect them to have a perfect performance um, all the time. Because one of the things I see with young parents now is this, you know, a pressure to jam all of these activities onto their kids is often overwhelming. And I didn't feel that. Did you feel that when you were raising your kids? I didn't do it. I mean, there were people out there did it. We called them super parents. They were like uh, the ones that their kids had to play travel everything. Yeah. Sharon and I talked about it even when the kids were, I guess, early teens. It's like these some of those parents, it's like their identity is tied up in how good their kid is because they don't feel good enough about themselves. Right. right. And it's like, dude, I don't how good, I'm, my my personal success is not whether my kid that's 11 years old scored a goal. Yeah. Jeez. Clearly, you've done something very, very well because you have three grown adults who are wonderful human beings and they all work for you. And if you don't have a great relationship with your father, you do not work in his company. So I think that says a lot. Were there times when your kids were growing up where you just blew it? Oh, all the time. What would you do if that happened? Apologize. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember any times that you would be willing to share where you really blew it? Maybe when they were teenagers with one of the girls or Daniel? You know, one that comes to mind is a little different than that. It was the result of having blown it uh, other times. And that was we left the younger two with the older one. And for the first time, she was the babysitter. Mm -hmm. And when we came home, apparently we left this child who was 14 and a sweet little girl. But apparently when we left, uh, she became Genghis Khan. (laughs) And she was a tyrant. And the other two rebelled. Uh, against this tyrant and I thought you know and and then she lost her temper with them and I thought and she's yelling and screaming at them and because they wouldn't do what she said and I thought she's being her father she was not replicating Sharon she was replicating Dave yeah and I said baby you you know this is a you you don't want to live your life that way Mm. and she and I got we went for a walk when we got home and I said you know this is where your dad's let you down you know, you picked up some bad habits. Hopefully there's some good ones in there that you picked up too. But kiddo, that's something you don't want to model after. Mm. And it wasn't that I was that way all the time. I wasn't, but I had been enough times right. 
that that she, that, that, it, it, that she as the oldest child. The problem is everything gets broken in on them. You <laughs> exactly, know? they and absorb so all the good they, and bad. The, we always laugh around the Ramsey table. The oldest one got all the beatings, you know. Yeah. And, the, and so, the, and then they warn the little one. Yeah. But there's nobody to warn the oldest one. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's so. right. Well, that's interesting because you you know how one of the things I talk about is how kids just watch us all the time and they just sort of pull in all the behavior they see and they internalize it and that's who they become. Did you change any of your behavior after that? I met Christ the year Denise was born. And so I had been through the process of changing as she was growing up. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to her at 14, what I was at the time I had that conversation was not what she experienced when she was five. Mm -hmm. And so I I like to think to a large extent that what she was doing was she got some of her earlier dad that by the time we had this conversation was a better dad Mm. and a better man. Mm. So I was, you know, growing up myself spiritually and learning. And so it wasn't like this snapshot in time. It was more like the end of the film strip, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Total sense. Uh, So I'm not saying by then I was perfect. I wasn't perfect, but I was a lot further along by any viewpoint. I was a lot further along by the time we had this conversation. But what she was replicating maybe wasn't the dad of that moment, but it was the dad of her youth, Mm -hmm. earlier youth. Has she um, has she let that go by the by now that she's a grown up? She doesn't do that anymore. She is very patient with her kids, but I see her those wheels turning yeah you know i see her catch herself she has to we all do i mean she's got a two and a half year old <laughs> yes, that's right. you know in order for the to let a two and a half year old live you have to catch yourself yeah. you know oh yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah i see yeah. her catching herself your faith is very important to you when you talk about a lot in the air and you know my faith is very important to me my faith in christ however you can't make your kids have faith Mm-mm. did you ever worry that they weren't going to have faith I'm more worried how much crap they were going to go through because they go from our faith to some kind of a dip. They step off a cliff of some kind Mm -hmm. uh, to grab a hold of their own thing. And and how deep is that hole that you got to fall in to grab your own thing? And some families go through that. Um, And I knew that there's always that kind of wilderness experience almost for a kid to to leave their parents' faith and find their own. uh, Just how, how, you know, is it the seven acre woods out back of Winnie the Pooh or is it, you know, is it the... 40 years in the wilderness of the children of Israel. And so how far before they come back around? And hopefully that's got something to do with what they saw Mm -hmm. and what is the foundation of what they, you know, were we living at home, what we said in church? So the way you worked at transferring a, a good faith and love for Christ to your kids was just you and Sharon living it in front of them. Example. Okay. Example. Yeah. yeah. We did not, we did, you know, we had friends that got their kids up five o'clock in the morning. They all had to memorize scripture and all that stuff. And that, that's enough to make somebody run from the faith probably. But, um, <laughs> I think so, no, I mean, yeah. it was just, we're, we were not hypocrites. Yeah. Period. That's who we were, who we were in front of church people in front of the pastor and behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. We're just the same people all the time. I try to imagine what it would be like as a kid growing up in the Ramsey home. And, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, here, you're, Never you're, dull. you're really kind of an enigma because I think to the masses of the millions out there who know you and listen to you on the radio, they would think, you know, you're probably a very prideful man. You're probably a very hard driving man. You're highly disciplined, self disciplined. I'm sure you worked extremely hard and you've got three kids. And she Sharon's just an amazing person. So do you intentionally balance your work life and your private life, or do you not? No, and I think it's an illusion. The thing that that offsets that is when you're on something, be on that. Mm -hmm. And so I heard Gary Smalley passed away the other day, and I heard him speak when we were just married, and him, him and John Trent, and um. John talked about, you know, you wear a sword at work, and when you come home, you need to take that sword off and put it over the mantle. Mm -hmm. You can't use the same sword on your family that you use at work. Same tools don't work. And and you need to shift gears, and you need to be present where you are. Mm -hmm. So many people say, I want to spend time with my family, and they sit in front of the television. Right. Or on their phone. Yeah. 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 I want to spend time with my wife, and then they go on a date, and both of them are sitting across the table from each other with their thumbs going, looking Mm -hmm. at a screen. Uh, And so be where you are 100%. And it offsets all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So my my kids, even when they were little, they knew when dad's at work, dad's at work. Yeah. Don't bother him. 
He's, that's what he's doing. But when I was present with them at the game, I was all in at the game. They got your attention. I mean, I coached Daniel's ice hockey team for six years. Now, there's you know, something I learned. Up. I never knew. You you play ice hockey. Yeah, well, sort of, but I, uh, enough, to <laughs> but coach, coach it. enough to coach the little kids. But I was all in. You know, we don't do stuff halfway. So if, we're, if it's Sharon and me going on vacation together, just the two of us, that's it. Yeah. And if I'm going to do emails... We're, we both talk about it. Okay, let's sit here and do an hour of emails so we both feel better. Okay, good. You know, I, there was, we started this thing. I was 16 hours a day for two years. Yeah. And, I, and honestly and truly. When we started it. I'm not there now. Yeah. But there was a period of time we paid a price to get this company off the ground. And Sharon's at home and she gets full credit for the success of this place, too. Because if she'd have been melting down back there, I wouldn't have been able to lay the foundation that grew this. Right. Exactly. It's a sacrifice. Dave, you have, and I have, three beautiful, amazing grandkids. Perfect. Perfect grandkids. Yes. Yeah, if we'd have known how great grandkids are going to be, it would have been nicer to their parents. It's the big payoff. Yeah. It is the big payoff. If you could choose one character quality to ensure that your grandkids have, what would it be? Integrity. Integrity. Now, integrity, the way... Our mutual friend, Henry Cloud, talks about it. When I say integrity, some people heard honesty, and that's only a small part of integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity comes from the same word we get integer from. Mm -hmm. An integer, if you're a math nerd, is any whole number, not fractured. Integrity means you're not a hypocrite. You're the same person at home you are at work. Uh, Integrity means that there's a wholeness to you. So that that word, in other words, the way I'm using it, would pick up a lot of spiritual things. Mm-hmm. It would pick up a lot of work ethic things. It would pick up in its wake a, a lot of compassion and generosity. It would pick up uh, a lot of gratitude and those other kinds of character qualities we want to see. They'd be sucked into the, the gravitational pull of the kind of integrity I'm talking about, which is a wholeness. Is this person whole mm-hmm. or are they fractured? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of fractured kids out there. And I mean, I think they're going to our grandkids are going to be growing up amongst a lot of kids who don't have integrity. And um, how would you intend to teach that to them? Your first lesson usually uh, when they're little is the lying because mm-hmm. they'll lie. And um, we just have a low tolerance for that. And so we start talking about that because and they do they start lying early oh it's two and three and four yeah but and see that's the for me i'm no parenting development expert or anything like that but for me lying to others is the setup to lying to yourself yeah and to allowing the devil to lie to you and you start believing lies Mm -hmm. about others and and then you've got a fractured mess on your hands Mm -hmm. uh, because you can't see truth because you're not living truth Mm -hmm. And don't be somebody in front of this friend that you're not in front of that friend. And don't be somebody in front of your grandmother that you're not in front of me. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're the same person all, all the, time. the time. Right. And we then, make- of course, of course, you have to teach it and then you have to live it in front of it. One of the things that I hear a lot from parents is um, a parenting philosophy now is that you explain things to kids. And then by explaining what are the right and wrong choices, the child will come to the conclusion that it's good to make the right choice. Horse crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I was so that. you're kidding no <laughs> people really yes, believe that yes. and that's very very common well fact. i mean that's like pitching a kid the keys to the car and go try it out kiddo right, right. no instruction at all right oh my gosh but, but 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 the whole thing is that kids fundamentally don't have the ability to no. always choose the right. nobody's ever taught them no Exactly. It's not like it's like it's hardwired right and wrong. And it's that's not ridi- that's it's, so it's ridiculous. Not intuitive. No, it's not. It's intuitive. not intuitive. And they have to be trained into a life of integrity and trained into a life of speaking truth because they don't choose it. And trained into discipline. Yeah. 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 No yeah. discipline seems pleasant at a time at no. the time, but it yields yeah. a harvest of righteousness. And that applies to adults, too. I have to be trained to sell. I don't know how to sell you. It's a it's a skill. You had to be trained to be a doctor. Yeah. You know, you, they weren't you know, they didn't go, oh, look, it's a pediatrician. No, they said, <laughs> look, it's a little girl. You know, <laughs> that's I mean, right. that's, you know, and I and that's it's such an important point for young parents to hear is that many parents think, well, discipline is so mean and cruel and everything. You know, it really isn't, because if you're going to be successful at anything in your life, relationships work you and i right now have to 
live lives of tremendous discipline to keep doing what we're doing. And you have to teach that to young children. And I think one of the best places to start is teaching them, you know, how to be truthful. But nurturing a character quality and integrity is extremely important, much more important than worrying about the externals. My honored guest is Dave Ramsey. Everybody knows him. Um, I sure appreciate uh, <laughs> Your eloquent explanations of everything. (laughs) Good luck with the edit. Uh, You're the best. Thank you so much. Well, we're honored to be with you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Dave. When it comes to parenting your child's inner world, I want to offer you three points to ponder. First, shift your focus from giving your kids things, and that includes finding the right school for them, buying them the right clothes, finding the right opportunities. These are all the external world things. Shift your focus from giving them these things to spending time with you. This is going to help build their internal world. Remember, time with you improves their self-confidence, their sense of value, their moods, and it shapes their identity. Now, let's think about this. And you can literally almost look at your child as a hard-boiled egg, okay? You've got the, the firm white on the outside. This is your child's external world. This is what people see. These are the clothes they wear. You know, this is their weight, their hair, the school they go to the grades they get, the sports they play. This is what you see and the world sees. And I will tell you, I have never met a seventh grader who feels good about their external world because every seventh grade girl and boy I have ever met feels insecure. That's the external world of your child, what your child does. But then there's the internal world of your child, your child's core. That's his character. That's his faith. Those are his feelings. That's his sense of value. That's his belief if he's courageous or kind or patient or long-suffering. So I want you to begin to see your child very differently, seeing his inner world and his external world, spending more time with your child because you understand that the more time you spend with your child, the happier they're going to be. You never resolve arguments if you don't spend more time together. You never resolve arguments, heal hurts, unless you spend more time together. Many parents, when they have an argument or a fallout with the kids, they pull away, they divide, they say, forget it, I throw my hands up. But listen, parents, you need to plow in there. That's how you resolve hurts and you resolve conflict and you resolve issues. You parent the inner world. You deal with their feelings. You deal with their anger. You deal with their sadness. Teach your child to identify their feelings and then talk about them. I'm angry. I'm sad. I hurt. So stop talking about what your kids look like and what they're doing and start asking them what they think and what they feel. Second, Compliment your child's character traits. We focus so much on what clothes our kids wear, buying them the right shoes, finding them the right friends, getting them in the right school, helping them to play the right sport. Stop doing that. When you want to compliment your child or you want to build them up, never, ever, ever compliment them on how they look. Okay. I want you to shift your focus and start complimenting their character. You can find great character traits in any child. Is your son strong? Is he courageous? Is he intellectual? Is he assertive? Is your daughter kind? Is she empathetic? Is she compassionate? Is she patient? Find character qualities that you see are strong in your kids and compliment them on those rather than their performance because that's what's really going to build their self-confidence, change their moods, and create great identity. Don't we want our young girls to grow up feeling emotionally, intellectually, and physically strong? Or do we want to constantly talk about losing that last 10 pounds so they go away and feel like they're a waif? Compliment your child's character. Third, Pay attention to their spiritual lives. Studies show that most kids have faith in God. So develop your child's faith. I know this is a little thorny for you, but again, I'm a child advocate. 
And I've read study after study after study that children are born with an intuitive sense that there is something more to life than they can see and touch. And as they get older, that is pounded out of them, not nurtured. Your children, I'll guarantee you, when they're five or six or eight or ten, are a whole lot more comfortable talking about God than you probably are. So if your child has that intuitive sense, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to grow it? Are you going to identify it? Are you going to build it? Are you going to talk to your kids about who you think God is and who you think he isn't? Are you going to talk to them about the Bible or are you going to tell them it's a bunch of nonsense? You owe it to your child. You have the right and the privilege to raise your child according to your biblical spiritual beliefs. Don't neglect that, parents. My job isn't to sit here and tell you what to say and how to say it. My job is to tell you every child has a spiritual inclination and you have an obligation to raise your child according to your spiritual and biblical beliefs because every child wants to know who God is. They want to know what he's like and they want to know whether he's floating or whether he has long white hair, whether he's kind, whether he's good, whether he sits there with a big, huge, long ruler, he's got to wrap him on the head. Many kids think that Don't let your child grow up thinking that and believing that about God. So never, ever, ever neglect your child's spiritual world. These three points to ponder are, first, shift your focus from gifts to time. Complement character, not performance or looks, and pay attention to your child's spiritual life. All right, let's get social. I want to hear from you and interact with you. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or go to megmeekermd.com and click on the links. You can send me a question on Facebook or email it to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Here's a question from Jose, and his question is, I feel pressured to sign my kids up for sports What should I do? Jose, welcome to the 21st century where life for kids is all about sports, 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 sports. Doesn't it make you feel kind of crazy? I'm telling you, many of my patients talk about the fact that they want to help their teenagers avoid caving to peer pressure. I totally get it. You know why? Because I think parents, we feel more peer pressure than our kids do. We feel the need to parent our children the way our friends are parenting their children. Again, it's a crazy train thing. Why? Because if our friends have their kids in two or three sports per semester, we feel like a bad parent if our child's only in one. Or if our kids play only one sport per semester, we wonder what's wrong with this. Let me throw this question back to you, Jose. What do you want your kids to do? You have the right, note the obligation as your child's parent, to put them in the number of sports that you want to do. If your kids don't want to play any sports, guess what? They're going to be fine. If they're meant to be an Olympic swimmer, guess what? Whether you sign them up or whether you don't, somehow they're going to find their way there. This is how I encourage parents to figure out what sports to sign them up for or not sign them up for. First, figure out what you want for your family. How much time do you want with your family? I think every family needs four meals per week together, non-negotiable. Studies show that the more time you have dinner with your children, the healthier your children grow up to become. So work around that. Figure out how much time you want with your kids. Do you want to spend an evening or an afternoon with them on the weekends? Is that very important to you? I think it should be. So figure out how many dinners that you want with your kids. Then you decide this is our family rule and work sports around the family schedule. If you have time for one sport per semester and your child really wants to do it, go ahead. If he really wants to have two and it won't cut into family time, it's okay for him to do. But let me tell you something. Remember this as you're signing your kids up. You have a dream. Every parent won't admit it, but they have a dream that their child will become the next Olympic blank. Figure skater, hockey player, gymnast, it doesn't matter. Let me tell you, friends, 99% of the kids who play sports like crazy in grade school, junior high, and high school never end up playing those sports 
in college. Look at sports as playtime. Look at sports as something that your child will enjoy. It'll help build his character somewhat. But you remember, his character is really grown by being face-to-face with you. So you cannot allow sports to interfere with his time with you. We all feel the pressure, and it comes from a fear that our child will lose out on opportunities to excel later in life. But you know what? Don't worry about that. Never parent out of fear. As always, keep sending in your questions at askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Parents, I need to tell you about something. I wrote an online program for parents of 2-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and 22-year-olds. It's called the Strong Parent Project. Specifically, I wrote a program, you can only access it online, called 12 Principles of Raising Great Kids. The reason I wrote it is because it's simple. My belief is this, if you get these 12 principles right, as you raise your kids from 2 to 25, you don't have to worry about the small stuff, your kids won't lose. I want to tell you that raising great kids requires a plan. This one works. You can join today. Go to megmeekermd.com and click on the Strong Parent Project. Parents, you're stronger than you think. Don't buckle to parent peer pressure. This is your child and your family. Being an excellent parent has nothing to do with your child's performance or how well he or she does at school or sports. Get clarity and stick to it. Do what you know is right for your child. You'll never regret having your son or daughter spend more time with family. But you may have regret the hours and hours he or she is away doing things at a high school or college sport that he gave up on afterward. And most kids do give up on these sports. Remember, these three points to ponder are 1. Shift your focus from gifts to time. 2. Compliment character, not performance or looks. And 3. Pay attention to their spiritual lives. Until next time, parents, remember, great kids are raised, not born. Thanks for listening to Parenting Great Kids. And don't forget to visit megmeekermd.com and click on the Strong Parent Project. If you'd like to tell us what you think, write us a review. And to catch future episodes, be sure to click subscribe. And as always, you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Meg Meeker.